Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It's July 22nd, 2015, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, just when you thought they've tried every trick in the book to disarm the American people, the creative minds within the Obama administration have come up with a bold new plan. Then, hackers using a laptop and cell phone take control of a Jeep Cherokee and crash it. And victory in Colorado as another district stops fluoridating their water supply. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Back when I was studying production in school, they had us watch this film called Network. And even if you've never seen the film, you've probably heard the quote, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And we have this photograph of Howard Beale, one of the film's main characters, and he gives this great speech, this monologue, talking about how people want to be left alone. He says, you want me just to leave you alone in your house with your TV and your toaster and be left alone? He said, well, I'm not going to leave you alone. And they're not going to leave you alone either. And who are they? The government. And now we have this story. Family threatened with government fine for parking cars in their own driveway. I'm angry. I, I am beyond angry. I don't see how the government can tell me whose car I can park in my own driveway. They can file this application for $150 for a special permit. It requires a current boundary survey. And the surveys I was told run anywhere from $1,500 to $2,000. Did the county tell you that? Yes. I'm having to pay to park on a property that I already pay tax on. And also the reporter in the piece talks about how they can get a waiver this time, but next time those kids come home from school, they're going to have to pay that fine. Officials stress that the rules are based on conservation, a nod to a draconian Agenda 21-style mandate, which local governments are imposing in the line with United Nations recommendations based on environmental sustainability. Earlier this year, lawmakers in Texas introduced legislation in an effort to prevent local legislatures from participating in the scheme with the GOP Senator Bob Hall speaking of the necessity to target city organizations in cities that are adopting these UN programs. And as we talk about the United Nations, it reminds me of a story Kid Daniels did, was it 2013, after we went to the Alamo. And it was very interesting to me that they attacked Kid on this because any 12-year-old with an internet connection can go to the Alamo website and see that they were under a proposition to become a United Nations World Heritage Site, and people said, oh, that's not true, and even some cocky uh, anchor down in San Antonio took a shot at us, and we're like, no, any child can see that they're actually uh, trying to make it a United Nations World Heritage Site. But these are the type of things that they're doing, and I want people to make uh, a note of this, that it's not a homeowners association that's doing this. This is the county, a Cobb County in Georgia, because we've heard stories of people being uh, having these type of measures against them. Veterans told that they can't put a flag in their front yard or can't wash a car outside. You can't let soap go into the sewer and all these other type of things. But this is the actual county coming after you if you dare have a car in your own driveway. And even more than that, if you guys go watch the full clip of what we just showed you, somebody snitched on these guys. It's like there's somebody in the neighborhood running around car counting the cars in somebody's driveway and then calling up the code at force like, hey, we got one over here, you can come get it. Mean, it's ridiculous. This is the snitch society, and it just goes to show the type of world we're living in when you can't even park a car in your own driveway. They are not going to leave you alone. Let's talk about something else. Another way they're not going to leave you alone, if you're a veteran, and you know you come back from combat, or you come back from overseas, and you want your rights. You know, Just like we saw recently, in a story we'll get to a little bit later, talking about the Marines, they want to have the ability to carry a pistol on them if they're working in these recruitment offices. And like I said, we'll get to that in one second. But these guys, they go overseas, they come back, they want their First Amendment rights, they want all their rights. They want the right to do whatever they want to do because they went over there and fought for it. And now they're trying to confiscate these guys' firearms. And we have Obama to issue executive order targeting 4.2 million retirees with a massive gun ban. Because seizing firearms from veterans has been so successful they figure they'll give it a shot on a much more massive scale, and they'll be using a presidential order to make that happen, an executive order. Seeking tighter controls over firearm purchases, the Obama administration is pushing to ban Social Security beneficiaries from owning guns if they lack the mental ca capacity to manage their own affairs, a move that could affect millions whose monthly disability payments are handled by others. 
The push is intended to bring the Social Security Administration in line with laws regulating who gets reported to the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, or NICS, which is used to prevent gun sales to felons, drug addicts, and so on and so forth. So let's say you're a veteran or just somebody who's collecting a disability check, and you say, hey, I need help balancing my checkbook. That could potentially bar you from owning a firearm, and they send somebody to go and get your firearm in this case. And anybody says, oh, they never did that in this country. Well, they did it in Hurricane Katrina. It wasn't even about disability. It's just they went and knocked on your door and uh, tackled an old lady, knocked her to the ground. It's on YouTube right now. You can type in Hurricane Katrina gun confiscation. So it has happened and continues to happen in the United States of America. While people say it's a conspiracy theory that these things go on and that you don't need a firearm because a paper sign that says gun-free zone is going to save you, although we all know that is not the case. Just look what happened in Chattanooga. Now let's move on to something else. So let's talk about things that move you. Let's talk about your vehicle. And we've talked a lot about this, myself, David Knight. David Knight is uh, especially against these self-driving cars. And it's not because he's a technophobe, it's that he recognizes you have a phone, you have a computer, you have a video game system. How often do these things crash? How often do these things freeze? Or are these things susceptible to hacking? Of course they are. And we know this, so when we think about a moving vehicle, we don't want these things to happen to us. And now we actually have it to where guys have hacked a Jeep Cherokee and actually prevented the person driving from using the brakes. Do it. Kill the engine. So we're killing the engine right now. I stomped on the gas, but the Jeep slowed to a crawl. I turned on my hazard lights, but I was still stuck in the right lane with no shoulder to escape onto. Guys, stuck on the highway. Uh, I didn't care, okay. And it was just last week I did a report about how one of these self-driving cars was hit. It was rear-ended. Now, and to be fair, in that case, it wasn't the car's fault. The self-driving car, it was hit by somebody else. But it begs the question, if a human driver was in control of the vehicle, could they avoid the collision altogether, just pulled off to the side? Or also, we saw the other self-driving car a journalist was looking at it, and, and I'm not sure what gave this guy such confidence that he would stand in front of a moving vehicle expecting, expecting it to stop like the Batmobile. But he stood there, gets plowed down by this car, and, and I'm hoping people start to realize that these things are not foolproof. Even uh, we talk about the advances in technologies, right? And the reason why drones are so popular, one, you don't put troops in harm's way, but there's this almost urban legend effect that people think that drones are ha have this surgical precision that they can zero in on a target and just take out that one target. No, the way drones work, is they send it over there and they knock down half an apartment complex to kill two people. The way drones work, they drive over there, they see a wedding party, they blow up everybody in the party, and it turns out that nobody in the party was affiliated with the drone in the first place. And the reason I talk about that is just advances in technology. Th these things are not foolproof. It takes years of beta testing before they even get to the point where they're palatable, but these self-driving cars are not that to this point. So I definitely encourage you not to put your life on the line with one of these vehicles, just drive yourself. And I understand there are applications for a self-driving car. You know, you're driving down the street, you have a heart attack. You know, you're in the car by yourself, maybe this thing can drive you to the hospital. I understand that. I'm saying by and large, these things are not as consumer friendly as they would like you to believe and anybody who has a grudge against you, you know, ex-girlfriend, whoever, that they wanted to, they could hack in and uh, destroy your car, make you run into a pole. Or even if you're not in the car, just drive your car into a lake. Uh, all types of uh, ill mannered things could happen from these uh, vehicles. Now let's switch gears and talk about transportation in a different way. And we have the article, record number of Syrians granted asylum in the United States. More than 800 individuals from Syria were granted asylum in 2013 the highest number since the Department of Homeland Security began tracking such data. The likely explanation for the 2013 figures, the most recent year for which the data is available, is the ongoing civil war in Syria, in which Iran and the Islamic State play a key role. And that's exactly right, but we cannot forget that some of the things that are going on out there are directly attributed to the United States government. We have people airdropping grenades over to ISIS, uh, militants, refugees, whatever the correct terminology may be. We've all seen the video that came out last year. You know, it's huge pallets of grenades, rockets, and all these things, and then somebody had the gall to say, well, you know, a couple pallets of grenades is not going to defeat the United States military. 
I'm sure it won't, but it will kill many innocent, unarmed people over there in Syria. So, you know, we have this mentality in the United States government that we'll go tear up a country and then we'll just allow the people to come over here to our country. And once again, I have no issue with Syrian refugees. I don't have an issue with anybody who chooses to come to this country in a legal and lawful way. My issue comes around when we set up a border patrol, we set up ICE stations, and then we just award people who can sneak past them. It just doesn't make sense to me why I would spend money on one while, you know, completely disregarding the other. So, you know, I have no issue with the Syrian people coming here, but I hope that we can get to a point where there is no longer a Syrian conflict, or if there is a conflict, it has nothing to do with us funding either side of the opposition. And I'm not vouching for Assad. I'm not saying Assad's a good guy, but Assad isn't airdropping grenades to people who are out there burning down Christian villages, chopping people's heads off, uh, having little kids run around with AK-47 shooting people in the back of the head, all types of wild shenanigans going on over there. And it's directly because the United States military, and even be, well, not the military, let me see the people above them, because once again, it's not the troops' fault, because the troops recognize what's going on out there, and they actually said, we refuse to be part of Al-Qaeda's Air Force when they wanted to send them over there uh, in times previous. So the troops know what's going on, but for some reason, the American people at large just can't seem to understand that we're funding this conflict. And uh, people know, uh, the people over there in Syria definitely know, and that's why they're coming here. But hopefully when they get here and they start to tell their story, people will realize this is not the correct way to go about the Syrian conflict. Now let's talk about the conflict in the political realm. We have Hillary Clinton, we have John, Donald Trump, all these guys who get involved in the 2016 race, throwing their hats into the ring. And now we have this article from Kurt Nimmo, MSNBC stunned by Clinton's upside down poll numbers. What does the Democratic Party do about numbers like this in Iowa, Virginia, and, and other, other important swing states, Colorado, for God's sake. Joe, I was just having this conversation with our own staff yesterday. If it wasn't for Donald Trump, the biggest story of the summer would be Hillary Clinton's problems uh, solidifying herself inside the Democratic Party. It would be really? the, the, it would be Bernie Sanders boom lane. And I can say this impartially as somebody who's not planning to vote for Hillary or Trump, that I find it quite amusing that they're so dumbfounded <laughs> at Hillary's numbers here. Because, you know, hanging out at Chipotle doesn't exactly boost you up in the polls. I guess she's starting to figure out. And people are starting to figure out, it's only taken a few years now, that radiation is bad for you. Now we have proof positive of that. We have some mutant daisies photographed near Fukushima. And all you have to do is look at the picture. And for reference, you can see on the far right-hand side, there is a normal daisy. But in between, you have three very odd-looking... Uh, creatures there. They lo almost look like lips, like little yellow lips. But, you know, that's what radiation does to you. And But, you know, people say radiation is good for you. And yes, some radiation, I guess, as you would call it from the sun, is good for you, but you're not supposed to bathe in the stuff. And if the stuff is washing up on your shore, you should definitely take account of that. Now, this can be our last segment for the night or our last story for the night before we go into more special reports. Colorado City stops water fluoridation following concerning study. Now, of course, we all know of the Harvard study saying that fluoride lowers your IQs, but now we have something else. A skier's paradise tucked into the Colorado mountains and part of Aspen has decided to stop fluoridating its water. The news comes just after the latest groundbreaking study on water fluoridation concluded that there was zero relationship between water fluoridation and cavity prevention. Now, everybody wants to say it's a conspiracy theory. You can just go and read this for yourself and get educated on the actual facts. And now we'll end with this, talking about food, the ultimate secret exposed. You can find this on YouTube. This is a report Alex did a few years back, talking about the dangers of not only food, but also fluoride in the water. In the Nuremberg trials, it came out that the Nazis were adding sodium fluoride to the water supply in the labor camps and death camps to make the population more docile and controllable. There had been hundreds of university studies before Hitler even came to power. This is a form of forced medication. They admit that one part per million of sodium fluoride more than doubles the chance of bone cancer in boys and men. As the public became educated in the last few decades, the government industry's response was to not just put it in water, but to start adding it to thousands of products, 
like children's water that's mixed with their formula or with their cereal. They started adding as much as 900 parts per million in things like powdered eggs. It causes reductions in IQ. It increases sterility or lack of fertility. And it's being added to so many of the daily staples that we consume. A very controversial traffic stop happened right here in the state of Texas. A woman was driving down the road, a trooper pulled up behind her, told her to pull over. And the reason we found out about this is because she failed to signal. Now, in the clip that we're about to show you, I'm just going to narrate over, it's quite a long clip. But basically, the trooper pulls over, you know, he writes down her information, he's about to give the lady a ticket. She gets a little lippy with him. But to me, the trooper's actions were much worse that just this lady getting lippy. Yeah, maybe she said a few choice words, but the trooper's actions were to tell the woman that if she did not put out a cigarette, he was going to yank her out of a car and tase her. Now, he did yank her out of the car. Long story short, the lady ended up in a jail cell. And this is all because of a failure to signal. This is how this thing all started. And then a little while later, they found the lady dead in the cell, which is completely uh, mind-boggling that you could go from something so benign as a traffic stop and end up dead in a cell. Now, some people are saying that the lady committed suicide. That's the official narrative. Other people in the jail said that the lady was very upbeat, a very positive person, all things considered, and they believe some foul play was in effect. Now, at this point, it's only he said, she said, we don't really know what happened, but it just goes to show how bad things can go in a traffic stop. And there's no one-size-fits-all solution to these things, and earlier today, Leanne McAdoo spoke to Eddie Craig. He's a regular guest and friend of the show. And I believe his exact quote when, when describing the officer was that he was a power-tripping cop. You know, regardless of what this lady said, when you get pulled over for a traffic ticket, you don't do too much that deserves going to a jail cell, especially when you just refuse to put out a cigarette. And you definitely shouldn't end up dead. So there isn't any one-size-fits-all solution to being pulled over by the police, but Eddie did compile this video a few months ago telling you what you can do when you encounter a police officer. Hello, folks. My name is Eddie Craig. I am from Rule of Law Radio. You can listen to our show on LogosRadioNetwork.com on Monday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Central Standard Time. I have been asked back to make a short presentation over the do's and don'ts of traffic stops as they exist here in Texas, but will generally apply across the nation. So please bear with me as I go through this. I'll try to keep it short and sweet and to the point. Now, for those of you that have gone to the logosradionetwork.com forward slash TAO address and downloaded the script, you'll be able to follow along with this. If not, you can go there and get it. We're going to cover first the do's and don'ts. First, do remember that in Texas, an officer is required to read you your rights before questioning or searching you if they have placed you in a custodial arrest. Now, what they won't tell you and what the court has ruled here in Texas in the case of Aziz v. State in 2008 is that in Texas, in a transportation stop, you are always in a custodial arrest. No matter what the officer tells you about a lawful detention, you are in a custodial arrest. Now, that is why they are required before searching and retrieving information from you to advise you of your rights under 38.22 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. They never do this. The other part of it is you'd be waiving specific protected rights by giving them information, one of those being your right to remain silent. So please, when you go through this script, understand that there is a legal reason for everything it says to do or don't do. Now, be aware that they almost never read you your rights, and anything you incriminating you uh, that you say they can use against you because it will be considered to be a voluntary statement on your part. So please be careful about waiving that right and providing them with information. Now, don't ever answer the officer's questions like, where have you been, where are you going, how many drinks you had, what have you been doing, and so on and so forth. That's none of their business. It has nothing to do with their investigation. These are setup questions intended to escalate this at the very first opportunity to what every basic transportation stop is meant and trained to be escalated into, and that is a DUI or drug bust. This is where their money and their ability to prosecute truly lies, 
and that's what they want. And that is what helps them get their promotions and their federal funding is to make those type of busts. So you are being played when these types of questions are being asked. Don't fall for it. Now, in relation to that, you have that right to remain silent. By answering those questions, you are waiving that right. So let's not do that. The other thing you want to make sure you do is remember to roll up all of your windows and to lock your doors as you're getting pulled over, not after the fact when the officer's walking up to the car. You want to do it before you actually come to a stop. First, you roll your windows down just in case, make sure the car's completely aired out, and then you roll everything up except for your window, and then when all those are up, roll your window up till it's about two to two and a half inches and no more. The officer has no lawful authority to force you to roll it all the way down. No law compels you to do that, therefore no law gives him lawful authority to demand that. He will accuse you of not following a lawful order. He may even attempt to charge you with that, but that charge is false and fictitious. There's no law requiring you to do it, therefore there is no law on which to base the presumption of it being a lawful order. Now. Don't open your windows, don't unlock your doors, don't get out of your car. Just don't do it. This allows them to intimidate you in other ways that you will not be comfortable with and you don't want. So please, stay in your car, stay where it's safe, no matter what they tell you. Because they don't have a lawful authority to order you out of your car in a transportation stop like they would if it was a DUI or a drug bust. And the whole purpose of this small portion of the window being open is to minimize their ability to make the accusations for either, as we will see. Now, that's why we don't ever roll down more than one window at a time. If an officer on the other side starts knocking on the window and telling somebody to roll it down, tell them not to do so. You don't want to create a cross draft inside that car that allows them to come up with the scenario of, I smell something because air was pushing through your car from the other open window. So just don't do it. Don't ever provide an officer with any documents or other information that they demand. And as you saw in the presentation I made last week on the interview with Jakari, the problem there is, is by production of those documents, one, it's a voluntary statement. Two, those documents, even unbeknownst to you, can potentially incriminate you in other ways and be used against you in a court of law to prosecute you. They cannot compel you to waive a protected right to exercise a privilege nor can they statutorily create the requirement that you waive the right to comply with the statute. Those are forbidden, and there's lots of case law that says it's forbidden. So we're just not going to play their game with them in that and waive our rights just because they're demanding it. They will attempt to charge you for it, which, as I also covered, is in of itself a violation of your rights to criminalize the invocation and exercise of a protected right. Your right to remain silent covers both production of documents and verbal and written statements. You don't have to produce anything that they can use against you. And since you are not an attorney, you cannot make the presumption that what you're being uh, required to produce can't be used against you. You see how this works? Without that assistance of counsel, those decisions can't be made by you, shouldn't be made by you. So don't waive your right and produce. Even if you get assistance of counsel, make sure your counsel understands what rights they're trying to tell you it's okay to waive because that's what they're doing. Now, don't ever give your consent to an officer to search your car for any reason. No matter how kindly and nicely they ask, no matter whether or not you think you have anything to hide. As I said in the original presentation I did on this subject, you don't know what one of your, uh, the people that you had in your car before, friend, family, stranger, whatever, may have left behind in your car. You don't know unless you clean it on a regular basis, both underneath the carpet and everywhere else. You don't know what could be in that car that could be used against you. You don't know what that officer's intentions are. He could be short on his DUI bus or drug bus for the month. He could be planning paraphernalia while he's searching your car. Next thing you know, you've got a drug possession or paraphernalia charge to fight against. Don't consent to warrantless searches. Just don't do it. Now, 
Officers will almost always insist that you are not under a custodial arrest, but rather are simply being detained or are part of an investigative detention. That's a lie, folks. Uh, I just did a write-up on a video from Rome, Texas, where two cops were harassing this lady and her son. Uh, I dissected that video minute by minute, and there, <laughs> both sides made their very big mistakes. The ones the officers made, however, are much worse simply because their mistakes resulted in a violation of rights, misrepresentation of the law. Basically, they're once again lying to members of the public to further their own ends. Folks, that's got to stop. We can't let them continue to get away with this. We just can't. So when they tell you you're in a detention, you are not. In Texas, you are in a custodial arrest. In almost every state, you're going to be in a custodial arrest. You will need to research the statutes and the case law there to see if that determination holds true in your particular state, but here it does. That is where 3802 of the Penal Code comes in, where they attempt to threaten you with failure to identify because you won't produce a driver's license or something of that nature. As I covered in the presentation last week, Failure to identify does not require physical production of any form of ID. It only requires production of three specific pieces of information, name, address, and date of birth. That's all. Do not go beyond that. Now right here you will see a basic breakdown, a graphic representation of the way the courts have ruled a determination of a custodial arrest is to be made. As you can see, custody is equal to custodial arrest or functional equivalent of a custodial arrest. Then we have functional equivalent of a custodial arrest is equal to a reasonable person considering the totality of the circumstances who would believe that he or she is in police custody to such a degree associated with a formal arrest. And coming up, we have more on the gun-free zones known as Army Recruitment Centers. And also, John Bowen has a special report on John McCain. I'm Jakari Jackson here for InfoWars.com. Myself and Joe Biggs are outside of an Army Recruitment Station or an Armed Services Recruitment Station in South Austin. Now, we've seen reports and threats of more shootings since the Chattanooga murders. We've seen reports in San Marcos, also places like Las Vegas, but it's not limited to there. I'm here with Joe Biggs, who's also a former Army Staff Sergeant. And Joe, what have these guys been telling you? Thanks, Jakari. Uh, yesterday, I was out here with uh, three other people throughout the day. I was out here for about six and a half hours. There's another gentleman over here to my left who was out here for about that long. He got here early in the morning. Now we have more people out here today at this location at the South Park Meadows in South Austin. We also have some people set up in Midland and uh, different various locations throughout the day in Texas. And we want to encourage people to get up. If you're a retired veteran, you have nothing going on today, get out, help support these guys who are, in it, who are in here and don't have the ability to protect themselves because our government will not allow that. The funny thing is though, is they trust them to go overseas, fight for their country, die, but they don't trust them to be able to protect themselves at home. That's something that we need to change. Now, yesterday I had the opportunity to speak with one of the recruiters behind me here, and he said that there were reports of threats at recruiting stations in Las Vegas, throughout Florida, and a location in San Marcos was getting a lot of uh, weird calls, crazy hangups throughout the day. And then also last night I had a older red Jeep Wrangler come through. A man was wearing a Marine Digicam desert uniform top, and then jean bottoms. He drove by, stopped, looked at me, saw me. I think he was a little surprised to see me out here and then sped off around this corner this way. I went over to the Marine Corps recruiting center behind me and notified them of that. And I asked them if they had anyone that who worked here at the station who drove one of those vehicles. They said no. They asked me what kind of uniform I said. I said it was a digicam. They said that's very unusual because they were told not to wear their uniforms at this location and other stations across the United States. You know, if you know Marines like I do, that's one thing. They're very prideful. And for you to tell them, for the government to tell them that they can't wear their uniform, that's a signal of pride. That's their heart. That's everything that they fight for. I mean, it's disgusting. Not only will you disarm them, now you're making them take off their uniform that they fight in. So I'm Joe Biggs with InfoWars.com, and myself, Jakari Jackson, and many other patriots throughout the state are going to be standing guard, making sure recruiters 
can go home safe at night. That was a clip from yesterday of myself and Joe Biggs outside of a military recruitment station. And the thing about these places is, is you can trust these guys to go overseas at age 18, fight and die for the country, carry a gun the whole time. But then when they come back, you don't trust them to have a gun on their person to guard their facilities. So people have to take it amongst themselves to go out there and try to protect the troops, as odd as that may sound. So we were out there yesterday, had no issues, no problems. But a caller called in today on the Alex Jones show. He said, hey, Alex, I went out to one of these centers just like Joe and Jakari did. But somebody came out and told me, one of the guys, they said that if I'm out here, they're going to have to call the police on me because the orders came from on high that if anybody's out here armed, that we need to call the authorities. Chris in Georgia, you're on the air. Hey, how's it going? All right, brother, go ahead. So, uh, interesting thing happened this morning. Um, I thought the whole Marine Corps thing was like the just one cracked out meth head that decided to go shoot Marines. And then when you guys reported that it was nationwide threats or whatever, um, I decided to go to my local recruiter's office this morning. <clears throat> and so I show up, and, and I'm not outwardly um, showing any weapons or anything like that. And then uh, there are some Marines outside. And I asked them if they'd seen any Oath Keepers. They put out a national call or anybody like that. And they're like, yeah, one person or something. And the guy told me, the, the, the I guess the head Marine recruiter told me that the Marine Corps Recruiting Command put out a directive today that if anybody shows up armed to protect the Marines, that the Marine recruiter in charge has to uh, call the local police, file a police report, um, call the Army Corps of Engineer and turn those people into them for trespassing on federal property with guns and uh, press charges. And there's a bunch of other uh, paperwork that they have to do. So the Marine Corps is pushing back real hard when, at least at the local level here in Georgia, it shows on the local news, um, you know, the Marine recruiters or, or whatever branch, the recruiters coming out and taking pictures with everybody and they appreciate it. But at a federal level, they're pushing back really hard. I had a few opinions about it, but... Uh, this is huge news, and I believe you sound very credible. The Marine Corps, I guess, under Obama, thinks it owns these Marines and thinks they're allowed to just set them out there as sitting ducks. We've confirmed threats and, uh, pouring in all over the country, especially. But if it's a shopping center and it's an open carry state, uh, and if the owner of the shopping center is cool with you sitting across in the grass, uh, you know, or whatever and protecting it, then I don't see how that could happen. But that's amazing. Don't even threaten them with trespass. I guess they want to get these patriots in jail as fast as possible. That is just incredible. Was the Marine, was the head Marine that you talked to upset by this, or did he love it? No, he was not. Well, he was real, um, you know, I, I guess you see it a lot in, in federal employees. Matter of fact. Really don't care. Yeah, he was like, you know what, I, I, asked, I asked him, I said, hey, do you mind these people coming out? Do you appreciate it? Do you not want them here? And he was like, you know what, I just don't want to have to call the police, and I really don't want to do paperwork. He said, if anybody's going to come shoot, they're going to come shoot. So he, What a he cowardly, kinda, uh, resigned attitude. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I have, a, I have a couple feelings about it. Um, at least at a federal level, there is a possibility that the next crisis could be averted by Americans carrying weapons, as opposed to the next crisis used to stop Americans carrying weapons. You just said it. They want what? more of these to happen so they can blame the Second Amendment. They have a major stake in demonizing common sense. They don't want a patriot to stop a crazy Islamicist. And so that's they're already upset about Garland. Uh, they're upset by the response of citizens wanting to protect these facilities. And you're absolutely right. Go ahead. Let's let's spitball it for a second. What happens if it were a nationwide threat? There was another attack, and, and uh, an oath keeper, somebody stopped it. What would happen is that makes the oath keepers people, heroes. That makes the Second Amendment a hero. And they don't want that. And even further, when was the last time Americans walked away from their, uh, you know, good employment, good hardworking Americans dropped what they were doing and picked up a gun for a common cause? Because I can tell you, 1776. American soil. That's right. And if that were to happen, and soccer moms and businessmen and and college students all showed up at recruiting centers and national guard centers, at least outside metropolitan areas like Atlanta, you would have thousands of armed people, easily, 
quickly. I mean, within an hour. And what would those people think? They would immediately understand the power that they hold. And, uh, you know, even wow. if nothing happened, okay, the next, the next national emergency that happened, would those people say, where's the National Guard? No. They'd say, well, hell, we can all go down there. We have more people than the National Guard. You need to have your own radio show, bro. The way you just crystallized that, boiled it down so simply, succinctly, with pure, rational <laughs> knowledge, and then I'm up here bumbling around trying to explain it. Exactly. That's why they don't want the troops armed themselves, because it's this idea that, well, then citizens can be their own security, and then that ends the need to take all of our freedoms to counter these manufactured threats. We've got to take this little piece that you just put out live and post it with a title saying... The mystery of why they want the recruiting centers disarmed revealed and explain uh, why this could become 1776 Part 2. It all began uh, in Michoacan, one state in Mexico, where just a few farmers fought back against uh, having their uh, employees killed at lime uh, farms. And then that spread all over the state then to other states till the army came in and disarmed them because the army works with the drug dealers openly in Mexico. And it's the same story. Just one person stands up and then defeats the enemy, or even is defeated. It doesn't matter. That act of defiance is infectious. And they don't want that humanity there. It's why they're getting rid of contact sports. It's why they're getting rid of dodgeball, why they're getting rid of tag, while they're arresting kids for their free speech, is to just create total ninnies that will submit to anything and everything for total enslavement. Uh, so, Chris, excellent points. I really appreciate you uh, doing that. And you're a citizen journalist. You ought to go back with a camera and see if they'll talk to you because we can't do it all. We need articulate, smart folks like you to be out there in the info war. So great job, Chris. And Joe Biggs went out to our local recruiting station, and they told him that their understanding of the notice is that they just didn't want people on their property. If you were someplace else in the parking lot, they didn't have an issue with that. Notice just said that they didn't want people on the Marine or the military property. Now, stay tuned. Coming up after this break, the report you've all been waiting for. John Bounds' explosive expose on John McCain. John McCain has had a long career, and that career has been stained by one awful mess after another. Whether it's his skin-saving leak to reporters during the Keating 5 corruption scandal. Charles Keating was the flamboyant owner of the risk-taking Lincoln Savings and Loan whose failure eventually cost taxpayers $3.4 billion. It was a very, very close personal relationship. The family spent a lot of time together. They traveled so often together with the Keating family, flying to their place in the Bahamas. On judgment, ethics, and truthfulness, he failed this test as badly as you can fail. Can't trust Obama. Or the now obvious boost he gave to Barack Obama's presidential bid. Um, he's an Arab. He is not. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma he's a, he's a, he's a decent family man, citizen that I just happen to have disagreements with, on on fundamental issues, and that's what this campaign is all about. He's not. Thank you. It's not only what you do in politics; it's what you appear to do. Peering behind the truth of McCain's media facade as a war hero. You do not think that is a war hero, captured or not. I didn't say anything differently, and if you read and if you watch and take a look at what you have, I said nothing differently. I'm very disappointed in John McCain because the vets are horribly treated in this country. While going to great political lengths to hide all of the information needed by now countless American families to discover the truth in what Pulitzer Prize winning author Sidney H. Shanberg described in a 2008 issue of The Nation as a telling mass of official documents. Radio intercepts, witness depositions, satellite photos of rescue symbols that pilots were trained to use, electronic messages from the ground containing the individual code numbers given to the airmen, a rescue mission by a special forces unit that was aborted twice by Washington, and even sworn testimony by two defense secretaries that men were left behind. John McCain spent his time at the Howlow Prison, a.k.a. the Hanoi Hilton, staring at death's door until his status as a POW was upgraded because McCain's father was a top admiral. 
After the signing of the January 1973 peace treaty, by joint agreement, the full text of the agreement and the protocols to carry it out will be issued tomorrow. Hanoi released 591 detainees. John McCain was one of them. In 1991, McCain was appointed as chairman of the Senate Select Committee on POW MIA Affairs. Due to the fact that internal Pentagon whistleblowers had been complaining for years that significant information was being withheld regarding the POWs, McCain would use this committee to cover up the truth all the way until today, following a pattern constructed by the White House since old Tricky Dick Nixon took office. Sidney H. Shanberg continues, included in the evidence that McCain and his government allies suppressed or sought to discredit is a transcript of a senior North Vietnamese general's briefing of the Hanoi Politburo, discovered in Soviet archives by an American scholar in 1993. The briefing took place only four months before the 1973 peace accords. The general, Tran Van Quang, told the Politburo members that Hanoi was holding 1,205 American prisoners, but would keep many of them at war's end as leverage to ensure getting war reparations from Washington. There's no telling how many POWs have died since 1973 waiting for our leaders to bargain them out of those nightmarish conditions. True unknown soldiers that may even be alive today. John Bound for Infowars.com. All right, great report, John. And also, Wayne Matson, investigative journalist extraordinaire, has something to say about the issue. John McCain, I mean, you, you've talked about him. I, I could go over his history, his past, the Keating Five, all of it, the fact that he's just a globalist all the way. But Trump comes out and says because he got captured, that's not a hero. Well, I mean, it's heroic to fly off the decks of boats and have that courage. I mean, I think that was a stupid comment, but boy, what if Trump really knew about McCain? I mean, all the stuff he did, being a trustee at the Hanoi Hilton. Can you give us the data dump on McCain? Yeah, quickly. Uh, yesterday, July 19th, was the uh, anniversary of the worst fire in the history of the U.S. Navy. In 19, uh, July 19th, 1967, the USS Forrestal uh, had a, a, a terrible fire on, the, on its flight deck uh, 100, uh, over, well over 100 uh, sailors were killed. Many others were burned horribly. Uh, back in the uh, 2008 campaign, I met with some of the people who were on the forest, and they uh, conveyed a, a story that was uh, uh, incredible that McCain, who they said was, uh, 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 of course, uh, injured because he was in his aircraft on the flight deck when the fire broke out, that he was his nickname was called Johnny Wetstart. And a wet start is where uh, a guy on the flight deck would basically rev his engines. And then you know how you shake a lighter and then you, you, you flick, it, flick it and you get like a big flame shoots out. Well, it, apparently it was possible to do that with his, uh, his aircraft, his A-4 aircraft. And, and, um, and, and so um, uh, the, the, there was an issue that McCain and the CEO of the Forrestal, Captain Belling, we're using 1935 bombs, thousand pound bombs, because you get more bang for your buck when you drop these things over Hanoi or Haiphong. Uh, other people said, look, they're unstable. It's 1935 mun uh, munitions. Use a safer 500 pound bomb. And, uh, and uh, McCain, who wore his daddy's rank, his dad was uh, a commander of the Pacific uh, Fleet. Uh, he decided, uh, no, no, I want to use a thousand pound bombs. And, uh, and so he and the CO basically conspired, uh, to keep using these. So when, uh, McCain, uh, uh, did this, uh, Johnny wet start maneuver, apparently cooked, it cooked off a, a Zuni rocket that was in the plane, uh, behind his. Now, uh, the Navy court of inquiry shows footage of, no, oh, that's impossible. McCain's plane was uh, the 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 uh, back of it was pa uh, parked out to the sea, so nothing could have he couldn't have done anything uh, like that. Well, look, the Navy handled the board of inquiry, and one thing I know about the United States Navy, having served in the Navy ten years of active duty and four years in the reserves, is that the one thing they excel at is cover-ups. I've seen more acts of cover-ups in the Navy than acts of heroism, and uh, and what the Navy Court of Inquiry did. In that case of the Forrestal fire was to exonerate McCain 
make sure that n nothing stuck to him. As a matter of fact, he was the first uh, sailor uh, uh, taken off of the um, Forrestal and, and helicoptered over to the Oriskany because people on the Forrestal, I was told by crewmen, knew what he had done and wanted to, uh, basically wanted to um, have a piece of Johnny Wetstart uh, after they saw their friends blown off the flight deck and horribly burned. Uh, so uh, I, I just wonder whether Donald Trump uh, 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 knew about the, uh, the, the significance of yeah, July. And by the way, this has even been in mainstream news a decade ago. This is known. And then I've had the people on. It's come out about how he was a trustee at the Hanoi Hilton who got women, good, uh, yeah. good food, everything. Yeah, and that he, uh, I was told by people uh, in, in, during the OA campaign, some of whom were POWs in, in Vietnam, North Vietnam, said he, he was singing like a canary that he gave six months worth of Navy operational flights, you know, planning schedules to the North Vietnamese uh, for better treatment. So it's worse than Trump said. It's not that he's not a hero, he's a traitor. Yeah, it's worse. <laughs> He's, we know this. He's a piece of work. Wayne Madsen, thank you so much for your time. And that's it for our show tonight. We hope you enjoyed it. Enjoyed it so much that you go to prisonplanet.tv and get yourself a free trial. You can see the nightly news, the special reports, the rants, all right there on prisonplanet.tv. Also, 